All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome to our uh, first pre recorded lecture for 115. We're going to start off our discussion in this course uh, looking a little bit at the physics of both static and dynamic fluids. Our big push uh, biologically for this is to be able to understand the nature uh, of blood flow within humans. Can we be able to answer questions such as, uh, for instance, if you're a smoker uh, and your arteries change their size, they change their effective radius, how much harder does your heart have to work to push blood through your body? It's a question we'll be able to answer. We'll also look at things like the Reynolds number, uh, the behavior of fluids for small microscopic objects. Turns out that their interaction with their environment is a little bit different in the microscopic world than it is in the macroscopic world. And again, this notion of the Reynolds number is going to help us with that. But before we get into all that, Today we're starting with just the, in a sense, the basics of fluids. We're going to develop, in a sense, what is a fluid, what describes a fluid, and of course this will be the nature of its density. We will motivate that uh, fluids can exert forces and can hence exert pressure on objects that are placed in them and on themselves and their environments. And this is going to get us at the notion of hydrostatic pressure. We're going to have a big equation today that's going to uh, express the nature of pressure. Within a fluid, we're gonna look at its dependencies. We'll solve a couple of practice problems and this will get you prepped for uh, the studio a little bit later today or whenever you're watching this video. And for later on this week, when we're gonna use this concept of hydrostatic pressure to develop a couple other ideas like the buoyant force and the nature of the um, energy exchange as a fluid flows. And this is of course called Bernoulli's equation. We'll get to that a little bit later this week. So to start off, uh, you'll notice that uh, a lot of these pre-recorded lectures are not going to contain um, an announcement slide. Uh, we'll try to push those out for you uh, in announcements, but since I'm recording these a uh, couple of weeks before uh, the semester actually starts, uh, we'll try to give you these announcements in situ. So most of these lectures are just going to be uh, purely content, maybe a major announcement if we need to make it. So we'll start out with the content here, which is the notion uh, of density. We're gonna find that this is really really important for us in our discussion of fluids. You may have a sense for this uh, already. You may have seen this uh, in your chemistry courses previously. So simply stated, what is density? So the density of any substance is the mass of that substance divided by its volume. In a sense, uh, density is a measure of um, how compact a substance is. If you have two substances that are uh, encased in the same volume, but one has a larger mass than the other, you're in a sense sticking more of the mass in the same amount of volume, therefore that material has a larger density as a result. Uh, do keep in mind that we're going to be using SI units in this particular course. So the SI unit of density, of course, will then be the kilogram per meter cubed. And we will indicate density here with a Greek symbol. This is the lowercase Greek symbol we will refer to as rho. Now we give you a table here with a list of some common densities, just to give you a sense for uh, how much this density can vary across di different substances. Note at the top of the table are what we would consider to be our gases, the helium gas and air at standard temperature and pressure. And notice how much its density is different from the substance at the very bottom, the mercury, which is the uh, liquid you will find in a lot of old school thermometers. Now, as it turns out, this discussion here, as we're going through uh, the next couple of days, are with respect to fluids. All right, now it turns out that both gases and liquids, by definition, are fluids. So a lot of this discussion here is gonna be under the context of liquids, of uh, water and mercury and things like that exerting pressure on their environments. But I just wanna make you aware that uh, all this discussion is indeed good for gases as well. Uh, we'll find in the next lecture that liquids can exert buoyant forces uh, due to the, to the difference in pressure across an object. Gases can do this as well, but it turns out that the uh, buoyant force presented by the gas is usually pretty negligible compared to other forces, so we don't worry about it. But uh, just be aware that this discussion of fluids does encompass both gases and liquids. Now, as we go through this discussion, I want you to keep this bottom bullet point in mind. Now, when we are discussing liquids, which is going to be the big, big push of this section um, to discuss fluids under the context of liquids, we are going to assume 
as we go through this discussion, that they are incompressible, meaning as you move through a fluid, as you go to different depths, as we look at different amounts of fluids uh, stacked on top of each other, the densities are not going to change. Now, we realize this is a, a pretty big assumption. You may be aware, of course, that uh, density um, depends on depth, particularly in the ocean, where um, density also depends on its salinity as well. And if you go really, really deep into in the ocean, you really can compress some of these layers of fluids and you can change the fluids density. That turns out to be very complex. So we are going to make the simplification and move through here under the discussion that the densities of our liquids that we are discussing are constant. All right. Now, we need to call back a little bit and remember our discussion from Physics 114. The big thrust of Physics 114 was to introduce to you the sort of major, the two major mm, mathematical mechanisms in which we understand the behavior of the natural world. And these, of course, were forces, a forces perspective, and an energy perspective. Now, since these fluids or these liquids contain all these different molecules that make uh, that make them up, these molecules can combine against or can uh, collide with other molecules, can collide against the walls of their chamber. This means that they can exert forces. We'll find here, though, that within these liquids, it's more interesting to talk about how this force is applied to some given object, the force that is applied over some given cross-sectional area of some surface. This therefore defines what we call the pressure of some given force. So simply stated, the pressure that a force exerts is the value of the force itself divided by the area over which that force is being exerted. All right, now units once again, the SI unit for force is a Newton. The SI unit for a length in physics is the meter. So the area of course will carry the meter squared. So in pressure, one Newton of force exerted over a one meter squared area, by definition is going to be one Pascal of pressure. The Pascal is going to be our SI unit of pressure. You're probably a little bit more familiar with another uh, unit of pressure, which is the atmosphere. This is a little bit easier for us to sort of discuss uh, the very large pressures that the Earth's atmosphere can exert on us. So it turns out there's a nice little conversion. Here we give it to you on this slide. So by definition, one atmosphere, which, the, which is the amount of pressure that you experience just from the ambient atmosphere around you at sea level, by definition is one atmosphere, which we will give you the conversion. Here it turns out to be about 101 kilopascals, 1.013 times 10 to the 5 pascals. You're probably also familiar with another unit of pressure. Um, instead of newtons per meter squared, we can talk about pressure in terms of pounds per square inch. This is sort of the familiar uh, pressure that is given on bicycle tires, on your automobile tires. They're usually measured in units of PSIs, or pounds per square inch. So here's another conversion for you. By definition, one atmosphere, again, that we experience on sea level due to the Earth's uh, atmosphere around us, by definition is about 14.7 PSI. Now this pressure will indeed vary depending on where you are. You know, the pressure on top of Mount Everest that you experience from the atmosphere is significantly less than the pressure you would experience at sea level. We will assume going through this discussion, unless we tell you otherwise, you can assume that all the problems that we're solving that have to deal with uh, these liquids and the pressures that are exerted on them are happening at sea level. So we'll ignore here uh, the uh, effect of pressure's dependence on the height of the atmosphere. We ignore it particularly because it is, turns out to be a little bit more complex than the pressure's variance of depth within a liquid. And we'll tell you a little bit why about that's the case um, a little bit later. So I want you to focus here on these two concepts that build this notion of pressure, force per unit area. This means that I can have the same force that exerts two different pressures depending on the area over which I am exerting that force. Now let me give you an example. All right, so here's an example here of exerting different pressures with the same force. I can poke at a balloon with my finger, 
But then let's say instead of my finger, I'm going to use a needle and I'm going to poke at the balloon with the same force that I did with my finger. The needle here, even though I'm pushing with the same force, the needle is exerting a significantly higher pressure because its force, if you like, is being concentrated into a smaller area. And remember this uh, idea from algebra, if the denominator of a fraction gets smaller, the overall result of the fraction gets bigger as a result. So here I'm making that area smaller. I'm forcing the force to be exerted over a smaller area and hence I'm exerting a larger pressure as a result. Another example you might appreciate is if you need to be outside uh, and you're walking over the snow, it's really helpful to do so in snowshoes because you're taking the force that you're exerting, your uh, weight, your mg's worth of your mass times the gravitational acceleration, and you're, you're um, spreading that force over a very large area, the large cross-sectional area of these snowshoes. Now, I'm not really sure if any of you have tried this, but if you've ever tried walking outside in a smaller shoe or even like a high heel, for instance, it's really easy for you to poke through the snow because now you're exerting your force, your weight, but you're spreading it over an incredibly small area, the cross-sectional area of that shoe. And remember, the same force with a smaller cross-sectional area means the pressure becomes significantly larger. The, the larger the pressure becomes, the easier and easier it is to, in a sense, overcome some of the surface tensions, uh, the elasticity of the balloon, uh, the surface tension inherent within the snow to be able to poke through it, and so on and so forth. So big thing from this is to remember that pressure is a combination of two things. I can have the same force that exerts different pressures depending on the area over which that force is exerted. All right, so let's start our first clicker question here. This is going to be an application of forces onto the new domain that we are discussing, which is going to be these liquids. All right, so this is what I'd like you to do. At this point, if you haven't already, please go into grade scope and pull up the grade scope assignment for lecture number two, hydrostatic pressure. We'd like you to follow along and fill out that assignment as you listen to the lecture here. All right, and as a reminder, there's no uh, penalty for right or wrong answers on the assignment. We're just checking that you're paying attention to the lecture, you're following along, and that you're not just answering, you know, E for every answer kind of a thing. So let's start this here. I'd like you to take a look at the picture that we've indicated for you. So I simply have uh, just a glass here or you know a container, whatever you like, that I filled with a little bit of water. I am going to um, pick out a little slice of that liquid. It's the top slice in this case. This is what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to pause the video. I'd like you to take a few minutes and take that slice of fluid here and draw a free body diagram for that fluid. Indicate all of the forces that are acting on this slice of fluid. At this time, pause the video, take about a minute, and draw yourself a free body diagram. All right, welcome back everybody. Now that you have a free body diagram in place, this is the question that I would like you to answer. This is going to be the question that we like you to answer on grade scope. And here it is. Based on the free body diagram that you drew, how many forces appeared there? So again, at this time, please pause the video, count the forces on your free body diagram and give us an answer in grade scope. Okay, welcome back everybody. Let's see how you did. How many forces appeared on your free body diagram? And here's where you have to remember, in a sense, where are these forces coming from? Well, what, what is, if you like, preventing this slice of this liquid from moving anywhere else, all right? Well, we need to consider that the liquid is being held in place by the walls of the container. So there are some normal forces from the walls. And don't forget that this container, in a sense, is, if you like, it's sitting on your table. So it is having the atmospheric pressure of Earth's atmosphere that is all around us that is exerting a force on that fluid as well. So in total, I count that there are five forces that are acting on this fluid layer. Let me show you what they are. Here's my free body diagram. Let's go through all these together and make sure that we have the same five. So first of all, like I mentioned, there are these forces here from the right wall and from the left wall 
of the container. I've labeled these as the normal force from R, the right wall, on V, the volume of water that we are considering. So forces from the left and the right wall. The slice of fluid itself has mass, therefore it has weight. So I've drawn my weight vector, the weight of the earth, acting on this volume of fluid. I have the normal force from, if you like, the layer of fluid below it that is preventing this top layer of fluid from moving downwards. So I have a normal force that is acting upwards from the layer below it. I also have a normal force because remember, the atmosphere exerts pressure. Therefore, it exerts a force as well. So I have a normal force from the atmosphere that is pushing downwards, that is providing molecular collisions that are acting against the top surface of this liquid pushing downwards. So I have now a normal force from the atmosphere that is also acting on this volume. So in total, I count uh, five forces that are acting on this volume of water. Now, Let's explore some of these forces a little bit. Let me ask you some questions about them. Let's look at this slice of fluid. And I've picked out this slice to be a very specific one. It is a nice symmetric slice. It's a nice rectangular one, in a sense. That has some depth as well. I mean, this is really a three-dimensional picture, but we'll focus on just the 2D representation at the moment. So given that I've drawn, and I've picked out here a purely symmetrical slice, how do the area of the top of this volume and the bottom of the volume compare. Pause the video and take a second if you need to think about it. So how did the top area and the bottom area compare? Well, I've drawn these, I've, I've specifically drawn this figure to be a rectangle such that the area of the top surface, again, this three-dimensional uh, projection sort of into the screen, the area of the top surface and the bottom surface are the same. I've done this on purpose. All right, so if this is the case, how do the magnitudes of the forces compare on the top and the bottom surface? Once again, pause the video, take a few seconds to think about it, and then come back and we'll discuss it together. Now here what you have to think about is, you know, I have these forces acting in the vertical direction, but um, in a sense, how many of them? do I have? Well, I have here that the normal force from the atmosphere is acting downwards, the weight is acting downwards, but the normal force from the uh, water below it is acting upwards. So in a sense here, I have two downward forces that are counterbalancing an upward force. So this means then that the magnitude of the force acting on the top surface, just this force right here, just the normal force being exerted on this slice of fluid from the atmosphere must necessarily be smaller than the bottom one because I have two forces pointing downwards that have to add to counterbalance this one upward force. So if I compare just the force acting on the top and just the force acting on the bottom, the bottom one has to be bigger because it's counterbalancing two forces that are adding downwards for this one force that is adding upwards. So now we have a sense for how the areas compare. Now we have a sense for how the forces compare. Remember how we combine the two. Pressure is a combination of the force and the area. So if the areas are the same and the forces are different, how do the pressures compare? Once again, pause the video if you need, take a few seconds to think about it. So again, we have the sense for the areas, we have the sense for the forces. Remember, force, uh, pressure is force over area. So if the areas are the same and the force on the bottom surface is bigger, this necessarily means that the pressure at the bottom must be bigger. And I want to point out very specifically, what did we just do there? All right, we have an expression here that um, mathematically relates these three physical concepts together, pressure, force, and area. And note, I'm, I'm not bringing any sort of uh, mathematical analysis into this, uh, mathematical analysis into this other than the form of the equation itself. But I'm claiming that since the area is the same, and since the pressure and the force are linearly related, and they're linearly related because they appear in the numerator on two sides of the equal side. They're an algebraically equivalent statement. Since this is the case, whatever claim I make about the force, as long as the area is the same, is the same claim I'm allowed to make 
about the pressure as well. And this may seem a kind of a little bit trivial, like, well, well, well duh, you know, I'm just, I have three things in an equation, and if one thing stays constant and the other thing changes, then the other thing has to change as well. Okay, well, that, that may be obvious to some of you, but I, I mention this here specifically because when we get into our discussion of viscous fluids, we're going to use this principle right here. This thing changes, this day, thing stays the same, therefore this thing must change in this degree as well. We're going to use that same principle, but we're going to apply it to a significantly more complex equation. So mentioning it here to make sure that we all have this sort of mechanistic reasoning in mind, and we're going to apply that same principle when we move forward into these more complex topics. All right. So what do we like to do with this? Again, our, our main mm, problem-solving procedures in physics, if you will, are to look at things in terms of a forces analysis and to look at the behaviors of systems in terms of an energy analysis. Here what we've done is we've started applying a forces analysis. We are going to apply an energy analysis for fluids, but when we get there, uh, that's going to be lecture number four. That's going to develop Bernoulli's equation. It's going to be an energy analysis. But here we're on a forces analysis. And what do we do? All the problems that we solve with forces always have the same sort of pathway and procedure through them, where we say, um, what are the forces acting on this object? I draw a free body diagram. Here it is for you. Uh, we developed this a little bit earlier in the lecture. Then what do I say next? Well, we know that these forces are bound to behave according to Newton's laws. Specifically, we're going to apply Newton's second law to this particular system. Newton's second law, of course, says that if I sum all the forces in one direction, it must be equal to the mass of the object times the acceleration of that object in that direction. Remember, Newton's second law is a vector equation, so you have to write it out in a specific direction. Let's do this here for the y direction. You might ask, you know, why are we not considering uh, the x direction? It turns out the x direction here is not particularly interesting uh, to consider because you have this one force here acting to the left. You have this other force here acting to the right. You would apply a Newton's second law analysis to it, and you would literally get that the left force equals the right force. It doesn't really give us anything new. So we're going to look at the y direction here. I have here, I've set up my Newton's second law for you, uh, the normal force acting upwards. And remember, Newton's second law is a vector equation, so you must include the direction of the forces as a plus or minus sign when you do this. Here, my normal force from the bottom is pointing upwards, and as a plus sign, the normal force from the atmosphere and the weight of that slice of fluid are pointing downwards, so they must accrue minus signs in my Newton's second law. My slice of fluid is at rest, therefore its acceleration is zero, so I'm going to put in a zero on the right-hand side. And then let me catch that a little bit. Yes, the, 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 the um, slice of fluid here is at rest, so its acceleration is zero. It's more appropriate to say here that the um, velocity of this slice of fluid is not changing. Its velocity is constant, therefore its acceleration is zero. So I'm going to set this equal to zero. I'm going to do a little bit of algebra. I'm going to move the normal from the atmosphere and the weight to the right-hand side of the equation, which removes the minus signs. And then I'm going to recall that these here are forces. Because they are forces, and I'm going to go back here, remember our connection here, that the force is pressure over area. So I can always write, I can spin this around to write that the force equals the pressure exerted times the area over which it is exerted. I'm going to do that here in my Newton's second law analysis. So I'm going to write here that the normal force from the water below is equal to the pressure at that point, we'll call it little p, times the cross-sectional area of the surface. Same thing for the top, except you'll notice here that I'm going to use um, p0 or, or p0. This is going to indicate for us um, the reference pressure of the system. The reference pressure is always going to be some point within the system in which I absolutely know what the pressure is. In this case, I know what the pressure is that is acting on the surface of this liquid. I know because the surface of that liquid is open to the atmosphere that the pressure of that point is exactly equal to one atmosphere of pressure. So I'm going to call the pressure there P0 because I know what that pressure is for certain. And we recall from physics 114 that the weight is equal simply to m times g. Okay, so what are we going to do with this? 
Let's see here. Again, as some reminders, uh, P0 pressure at the surface. And again, I'm going to couch this by saying more correctly that this is the reference pressure. It is the location at which the pressure is known, which is usually going to be the surface of some fluid, because any fluid that is open to the atmosphere experiences one atmosphere of pressure acting on it. So in this case, I know the pressure at the surface. It is one atmosphere of pressure. Now, here's something you need to get used to. It turns out, as we go through this discussion of fluids, that talking about um, the mass of a particular slice or a particular little piece of a fluid is a little bit clunky. It's a, it's a little bit cumbersome to, in a sense, be able to figure out what the mass of some particular fluid is. So here we're going to appeal to our expression of density and become very familiar with this substitution. We're going to do the substitution all the time in fluids, where because by definition density is mass over volume, I can multiply through by the volume and I get this nice little connection here, which is the mass of any substance is equal to its density times its volume. I can always make this substitution. And that's what we're going to do here. But here, I know what this volume is. Because I've made it a rectangle. The volume of any rectangle is the surface area of one of its sides times its depth. So here, I'm going to call it the depth or the height of this particular block, D. And to keep consistent with the other slices, I'm going to make its cross-sectional surface area times A. Notice when I do this that I will have a factor of capital A, that cross-sectional surface area, in every single one of these terms in my Newton's second law analysis. This means that they will cancel. And I will be left with this beautiful relation right here. Now, I'm going to go to the next slide. It's going to contain this equation, but I want to talk about this just a little bit. And here's where we end up. This is our big discussion for today. Here's our big equation that we have developed in this lecture. This is known as the hydrostatic pressure equation. And it says, if you know the pressure at some point in a fluid, again, this is called the reference pressure. This is our P0 or our P0. If I know what the reference pressure is, usually atmospheric pressure, but not necessarily always. If I know what the reference pressure is, the pressure at any point at any depth within a liquid is going to be the reference pressure plus the density of the liquid, the gravitational constant, 9.8 meters per second squared, times the depth that you have uh, gone within that fluid. You may also see this written um, as density times G times H, where H is the height within that particular fluid. Note that this is a little bit of a weird convention where you know, we start at a reference pressure here, and then the pressure increases as we go downwards. So here, if you go downwards within a fluid, this value of D here, this depth or this height, is a positive number. This is, this is kind of the opposite from convention. So going downwards in fluids is a positive value of depth. Now, a couple of things I want you to notice from this expression. Number one, we developed this connection assuming the fluid is at rest. When we get into talking later this week about fluids in motion, we're going to throw some weird things at you about the comparisons of the pressures within the fluids. When we get to that point, this equation is no longer valid. If a fluid is in motion, this equation does not apply. This equation is good for fluids that are at rest. So be careful when we get to Bernoulli's equation. Some of you are going to try to apply this equation to moving fluids, and you're going to get some weird results. So be aware that this is only good for fluids at rest. Also, I want you to notice the dependence of two things within this equation. Number one, the pressure of a fluid depends linearly on its depth. If I double my depth within a fluid, the pressure will increase by a factor of two, all right? So if I'm four times as deep in a fluid, I will have four times the amount of pressure. I also want you to notice, maybe more importantly, that the pressure of a fluid depends on its density. More dense fluids can exert larger pressures. In a sense, this is because the way that they are packed 
Remember that more dense fluids, in a sense, are shoving more mass, are shoving more material into a smaller area, into a smaller volume. So it makes sense that if I'm shoving more mass into a smaller area, they can exert larger forces. They can exert larger pressures as a result. So again, reminder, two big things from this expression. Pressure depends linearly on depth. The deeper I go into a fluid, the more pressure the fluid exerts on me. That pressure also depends on density. The more dense the fluid is, the more pressure that it can exert. Conversely stated, the less dense a fluid is, the more of that fluid you will need to create the same amount of pressure as a fluid that has a higher density. And we'll give you some practice problems on these a little bit later in the lecture. All right, let's test it out. We just developed our hydrostatic pressure equation. We understand its dependency on two very large things and the reference pressure. So let's try this here. Once again, go into grade scope, open up um, the next question, which is gonna ask you about relating these pressures. Go ahead and pause the video, take about a minute, think on this question and give us your answer in grade scope. All right, welcome back. Now let's think about this question here. Now remember from the previous slide, what does pressure depend on? Pressure depends on density. Pressure depends on depth. Here we have the same fluid all the way through. So in a sense, we can ignore the density dependence. The fluid is not changing. So now all we have is that pressure depends on the depth of the fluid. Since two and three, are deeper in the fluid than point one, they must be exerting larger pressures. And here's the stranger thing. Since two and three are at the same depth with respect to the surface, this necessarily means that two and three are at the same pressure. And this is kind of weird because two has this fluid column above it where three has the container wall above it, but we fall back to hydrostatic pressure to say the hydrostatic pressure within a fluid only cares about its depth. It does not care what the shape of the container is. It does not care whether or not there's a wall above that point or whether or not there is fluid above that point. Pressure in a fluid only cares about depth. The shape of the container does not matter. In a sense, what you have here is um, the weight of the fluid that is above point two and is providing the pressure uh, at point two is exactly equal to the normal force that the wall is presenting to the fluid at point three. Since those forces are equal, the pressures are equal. We don't, you don't have to go into that depth uh, if you don't want to discuss it at that level, but for those of you who are really just fighting this, like why doesn't the shape of the container matter? It, it, it turns out that this is taken to effect by the walls of the container, exerting forces on the fluid that exactly equal the pressure of the fluid at that depth. I can also spin this around to say that, remember, um, the hydrostatic pressure equation said that pressures at the same depth are the same as long as the fluid is at rest. So if I had here, that the pressure at points two and three were different, this would violate our hydrostatic pressure condition. So in case in point, if the pressures at two and three at the same depth were different, it would mean that the hydrostatic pressure equation does not apply, which would mean that this fluid is in motion. It is not at rest, okay? All right, now, another definition for you. It turns out a lot of times that we want to mm, get rid of this notion of atmospheric pressure because all the problems that we have to do, uh, all of the um, fluids and gases that we explore uh, at sea level in our laboratories and uh, the experiments that we do, every single one of them is bound to atmospheric pressure being exerted on that particular object. So sometimes what we want to do is say, you know, can I have a sense for um, what the extra pressure is that is above the atmospheric pressure? If I could remove the effect of atmospheric pressure from a system, what would be the net pressure that this fluid is exerting? This is referred to as the gauge pressure 
of some object. And let me give you an example here uh, with a basketball. So I could have a basketball here on the left. It's completely flat, so it has no extra air inside of it. The absolute pressure that is being exerted on that basketball is one atmosphere because it's sitting here on my table. It's sitting out on your driveway. Atmospheric pressure is being exerted on it. But because that basketball has no extra pressure, there's no pressure being exerted on it above one atmosphere, we would say that its gauge pressure is zero. In a sense, gauge pressure describes exactly what it is. Uh, if you took a gauge, some sort of uh, uh, air pressure gauge, one of those standard ones that you would find, and you um, put it uh, onto this flat basketball. You plug the needle in and you had it measure uh, what the pressure is at that particular point. It would, re it would register zero because it's not reading any pressure above the atmosphere. But now we look at the inflated basketball. And let's say we've inflated the basketball up to uh, 25 PSI, 25 pounds per square inch. All right. Remember, atmospheric pressure is 15 pounds per square inch. So if I took a pressure gauge and I pushed the needle into this basketball, it would measure a gauge pressure of 10 pounds per square inch because that gauge takes the absolute reading that it receives, subtracts off the effect of atmosphere and gives you what is left over, the effect of the ambient pressure that is inside this basketball. So this is what defines gauge pressure. Quite simply, it is the absolute pressure or the total pressure that you measure and you remove the effect of atmosphere. So in a sense, again, it is the um, leftover pressure, the pressure that is above the effects of atmospheric pressure. So in the case of the basketball, I'll go back one slide, recall the total, the absolute pressure was 25 pounds per square inch, but when I remove the effect of atmosphere, I now have the gauge pressure, which would be read uh, again by one of those tire gauges or these uh, uh, air pressure gauges and would read here as 10 pounds per square inch. All right. Now, unfortunately, we don't have the chance to show you this here. I think there might be a video uh, that we post uh, that you could look at, but just in case not, uh, here's a nice little demo that we would normally perform uh, for the class uh, that is in session. And we have a nice little setup where uh, we would uh, get a volunteer, we would have you blow into a tube, and that tube would be connected to another vertical tube. And in a sense, all you're doing is just pushing liquid up that vertical tube. And the question here, what we want to answer is how much gauge pressure can your lungs exert? This is the, to answer, for instance, you know, why can I very easily blow up a, um, a beach ball or, you know, in some cases, even uh, a basketball, but I can't blow up um, a, a car tire with my lungs, for instance. Well, let's do a quick calculation to find out why. So, once again, we would get a volunteer. We have this person blow into a tube and this pushes uh, water uh, up another vertical tube. We would measure how far that person is able to blow this liquid up another tube. It turns out to be about a meter, give or take, is the amount of distance that uh, you can push water up a vertical tube. So let's do a calculation here using our notion of gauge pressure. So remember, gauge pressure here, is the difference between the absolute pressure and atmosphere, uh, atmospheric pressure. The person blowing into this tube is uh, blowing into the tube under the effect of atmospheric pressure. So I'm going to remove that and say that the gauge pressure here is the extra pressure that your lungs can exert that is above atmospheric pressure. So we'll call it here. Uh, the gauge pressure would then be the pressure of the lung, which is simply going to be rho g times h. Now again, typically when we see a student, uh, student do this experiment, they can raise the water by about a meter. So let's just throw in some numbers. The density of water is about 1,000 kilograms per meters cube. Let's approximate uh, g to be 10 meters per second squared. And again, usually we find that students can raise this column of water by about a meter. Combining all these together and converting into um, atmospheres in PSI, we find this is about 10,000 pascals, which is about a tenth of an atmosphere corresponds to about one and a half PSI. So our lungs can exert a gauge pressure of not that good, about a PSI and a half. So our lungs can inflate beach balls. We can inflate uh, you know, other beach toys and, and things like that, but I cannot exert enough gauge pressure to inflate a basketball. I cannot exert enough gauge pressure to inflate a car tire, which is going to require more of like a, the realm of tens 
of PSIs, which our lungs just cannot exert. All right. In a sense, now we have all the concepts in play with the exception of one more rule that we'll develop here in a little bit. So let's practice a couple of more questions that are gonna uh, push you into the direction of what we will look at in studio. So I'll give you the chance to read this question here. I have a uh, YouTube that I'm gonna fill with water and I'm gonna pour some oil onto the left-hand side. Now there's some oil there, but I haven't shown you where the top surface of that oil is. We're gonna discuss that in a later question. For now, I would like you to compare points A and points B. So at this time, please pause the video, go over to Gradescope, read through this question, decide on an answer, let us know uh, what you think. When you're done, go ahead and resume the video. All right, welcome back. So let's talk about this question here. How does the pressure at A compare to the pressure at B? Now, remember this beautiful connection that we had earlier. What does the pressure in a fluid depend on? Pressure in a fluid depends on its depth. Pressure in a fluid depends on its density. So watch what I can do here with points A and B. I can connect points A and B, I can in a sense get from one point to the other without having to change the fluid that I am in. I can kind of go through the bottom of this fluid here. A and B are also at the same depth, or if you like, at the same height with respect to the bottom of the container. This means that the pressures at points A and B are the same. We can also go back to this argument here to say that, well, you know, I have this sense again that pressure depends on depth. And from our question earlier, if two points are in the same liquid and at the same depth, they must be at the same pressure. And we can again use the same idea that we developed to say, well, if they're not at the same pressure, our hydrostatic pressure equation does not apply, which means that fluid must be in motion. All right, so in a sense, the pressures here have to be the same. Otherwise, the fluid wouldn't be at rest. And again, we'll discuss what that means when a fluid is in motion a little bit later uh, this week when we get into um, our ideal fluids. All right. Now, let's think about this here. We argue that the pressures at points A and B must be the same. I can connect the two points uh, by moving through the same density fluid, and they're at the same horizontal level with respect to each other. Incidentally, this is known as the horizontal line rule. Now, I have some oil over here that is above point A. I mean, it's, it's gonna fill up to some point and we're gonna decide where the surface of that point is going to lie a little bit later. Now I'd like you to compare point C, which is the top of the water, and the top surface of the oil, which I haven't shown you. It's gonna be somewhere over here. We're gonna figure out where it is. How do the pressures at those points compare? Top surface of the oil and the top surface of the water. Once again, pause this video, think on this question, give us our answer, uh, your answer on grade scope, and then go ahead and hit play. All right, how do the top surfaces, uh, the pressure at the top surfaces here compare? Now, remember a very powerful statement that I gave you earlier. Any object that is open to the atmosphere, this is the top surface of a liquid, this is your computer, your mouse, your entire body, any surface that is open to the atmosphere experiences one atmosphere of pressure acting on it. So since this top surface over here, point C, and the top surface of the oil, wherever it turns out to be, because both of those are open to the atmosphere, they both must be at the same pressure, which is going to be atmospheric pressure. So yes, you may argue that, well, the top surface of the oil is going to be a little bit different than the top surface of the water, and you're absolutely right. Well, then doesn't that mean that the top surface of the oil is at a different elevation? So wouldn't it experience a different atmospheric pressure? Technically speaking, you are correct, but remember our assumptions coming into this unit. Fluids are incompressible and don't change their density, and we're not going to worry about the fact that atmospheric pressure depends on height. All right, any fluid in this course that is open to the atmosphere experiences one atmosphere of pressure. Any changes on it are completely negligible with respect to this class. So. 
top surface of the water and the top surface of the oil must be at the same pressure and that pressure is one atmosphere of pressure. Now, with all these ideas in mind, let's answer the tricky, uh, the tricky question, which is, where is that top surface of the oil going to be? Is it gonna be the same as the top surface of the water? Is it going to be above it or is it going to be below it? Once again, think on this question, pause this video, go over to Great Scope, give us an answer, come on back, hit play, and we'll talk about this question. All right, so where's the top surface of the oil going to be? Here we have to use a couple of ideas. First of all, the idea that the pressure at points A and B are the same. If the pressures at points A and B are the same, we can then fall back on our other connection of pressure, which is remember, pressure depends on depth. Pressure also depends on density. The more dense fluid can exert a larger pressure. I also want you to think about it this way. Pay attention here because this is really important. Because pressure depends linearly on density, the more dense a fluid is, the faster the pressure changes as you move through it. This is such an important statement. I need you to understand this. I'm going to say it again. All right. Pressure depends on density, linearly on density. Therefore, the more dense a fluid is, the faster the pressure changes as you move through it. So to answer this question, I need to think about how do the pressures, excuse me, how do the densities of oil and water compare? Well, remember back to one of our very first slides. The density of oil is less than the density of water. Water is more dense, therefore the pressure changes more quickly as you move through the water as compared to moving through the oil. Therefore, you need more oil to get to the same change in pressure that you received with the water. Therefore, the top surface of the oil, as I've indicated here, is going to be above the top surface of the water. Now, you can think about this two different ways, and I'll present this to you two different ways. First of all, if the pressures at points A and B are the same, if you buy this, all right, pressures at points A and B are the same, the pressure at the top surface of the oil and at point C is also the same. Remember, they're open to the atmosphere, so the top of the oil and point C are going to be at atmospheric pressure. I can move up from B to get to C, I can move up from A to get to the top surface of the oil. I have to experience the same change in pressure, be it A or at the same pressure, and the top surfaces are at the same pressure. I must change the pressures equally as I move through them. But remember, the less dense a fluid is, the slower the pressure changes as you move through it. So if I have to experience the same change in pressure as I move upwards, I need more oil to get the same change of pressure as water because oil is less dense. A less dense fluid changes its pressure more slowly as you move through it. The exact argument works from the other way. The top of the oil in point C are open to atmosphere, and A and B must be at the same pressure because of the horizontal line rule. I can connect the two points through the same density fluid, and they're at the same horizontal level. So I move down through C, I move down from the red line to A. But remember, the more dense a fluid is, the faster its pressure changes as you move through it. Therefore, I need less water, less of the higher dense fluid, higher density fluid, to get the same pressure change as a lower density fluid like my oil. All right, now, if that's the case, let's compare a couple of other points in here. Let me draw another point in here. I'm gonna call this point D. Notice that point D is below the surface of the oil, all right? It's inside the oil, whereas point C is still at the surface of the water. I'd like you to compare for me, please, the pressures at point C and D. Once again, pause this video, take a few seconds to think on this question, give us your answer in great scope, 
and then continue the lecture. All right, points C and D. Once again, I will give you two arguments to answer this question. The first is this, what is the pressure at point C? Well, point C is open to the atmosphere, therefore point C is experiencing one atmosphere of pressure. The top of the oil, which is here at the red line, is also experiencing one atmosphere of pressure because it is open to the atmosphere. Therefore, if point C is one atmosphere, point D is below the surface of the oil, which is at one atmosphere. Therefore, D is at a depth in the oil below one atmosphere of pressure. Therefore, the pressure must be bigger at D as compared to C. Let's do it the other way. The pressures at points A and B are the same. Let's move upward from A to D. Let's move upward from B to C. I move from B to C and I move from A to D the same vertical distance. So now what matters is the density. Remember this statement. The more dense a fluid is, the faster the pressure changes as you move through it. So I move upward from B to C. The pressure goes down really fast because that's a really dense fluid. I move upwards from A to D. The pressure still goes down, but it doesn't go down as much because oil is less dense. The pressure changes more slowly, all right? So the pressure goes down a lot moving from B to C. The pressure goes down only a little moving from A to D. So which one ends up at the higher pressure? The pressure that dropped really fast or the pressure that dropped more slowly? The pressure that drops more slowly ends up at the higher value of the pressure. Once, in, uh, once again is our answer of point all right, a little bit of a summary of all the things that we developed to solve these kinds of questions. And this more or less is the procedure that you want to go through when you're solving hydrostatic pressure problems. Find the point in the problem where you know what the pressure is. This is the reference pressure. Usually it's going to be a fluid that is open to the atmosphere. Usually it's going to be uh, uh, an atmosphere's worth of pressure. But you could have that um, the top surface of that fluid is open to some gas at some other pressure. You could have that the fluid is totally enclosed, but you know what the pressure is at some point. For instance, uh, we'll give you some problems in studio where you're comparing the pressure of your heart to the pressure of that fluid at some point in your calf. In that case, I would know the pressure at my heart. That would be the reference pressure in this case. See if there's a point in a problem where you can use the horizontal line rule. Can you connect the two points by moving through the same fluid? Are the two points at the same horizontal level? If they are, they necessarily must be at the same pressure. This is the advantage of the horizontal line rule. And then use the connections that the hydrostatic pressure equation gives you. Uh, pressure depends linearly on the depth. The deeper you are, the bigger the pressure is. Pressure depends linearly on the density. The more dense a fluid is, the more pressure it can exert. The more dense a fluid is, the faster the pressure changes as you move through it, both upwards and downwards. All right. Let's finish off class today. I have a few more questions I'd like you to think about. So let's think about this one here. Here's a bit of a strange shape, but again, remember the big point from earlier. Pressure does not care what the shape of the container is. Hydrostatic pressure only cares about the density and the depth. You only compare those two things when you're talking about pressure. So try that out here with this question. Uh, here's a couple of label points, A through D. Please rank for me the pressures at those various points. Once again, pause this video, take a few uh, seconds or a minute if you need to think on this question, give us your answer in grade scope, and then come back to the video when you're done. All right, so remember, the big thing here, pressure does not care about the shape of the container. Pressure cares about density, pressure cares about depth. In this case, it's the same fluid all the way through. So the density is the same. All I have to compare here is the depth. C is the deepest with respect to the surface of the fluid, therefore it's the largest pressure. The next uh, uh, depth 
I suppose, if you will, is A, next is B, next is D. So I simply need to rank these by their depth. D will have the smallest pressure, C will have the largest. Because once again, pressure cares about density, pressure cares about depth, pressure does not care about the shape of the container. Now let me change this just a little bit. I'm gonna remove a little bit of water from this problem. Here you go. I've siphoned out a little bit of water from the left-hand side. Now let's just compare points D and A. Point D, is it equal to an at one atmosphere of pressure? Is it greater than or is it less than? Once again, take a few seconds, pause this video, give us your answer on great scope, and come back to this video when you're done. All right. Now, for this one, you need to apply the idea that, remember, any portion, any location of any fluid or any object that is open to the atmosphere will experience one atmosphere of pressure. Which of these four points is open to the atmosphere? Well, on the right-hand side, I have a stopper at that point. That um, portion of that fluid is, in a sense, not allowed to experience the atmosphere of pressure. The only point here that is open to the atmosphere is point A. Therefore, point A is at one atmosphere of pressure. Now I can use our horizontal line rule. Let me see if I can annotate this for you. Let's try this. You betcha. So now I can use the horizontal line rule as I've drawn in here. Now remember, Every point along this line must be at the same pressure. And it must be at the same pressure because I can connect every point on this line in the same fluid, and all points on that line are at the same depth. So this means that this point here, point A, is open to the atmosphere. It also means that this point over here, whoops, must also be at one atmosphere as well. So if you buy that, if you buy that the point here that's being given by my laser pointer must be at one atmosphere of pressure, then what am I doing? I am at some reference pressure, which is this point in the fluid, and I am moving upwards. As I move upwards through a fluid, the pressure goes down. Therefore, the pressure at point D is going to be less than one atmosphere of pressure. All right, so you sort of have here that the, uh, in a sense, stopper is forcing that liquid to not be able to experience the effect of the atmosphere. So any um, effect of the pressure on that point is going to be the pressure that the uh, fluid is exerting on the stopper. And then by Newton's third law, the back pressure that the stopper is exerting on the fluid, which by the reasoning that we just went through must be less than one atmosphere of pressure. All right. That finishes up our lecture for today. Thank you for uh, watching and paying attention. Make sure you finish uh, submitting your grade scope assignment, and I will see you for the next lecture, which is going to be the concept of buoyancy. As a bit of a preview, we saw here that pressure depends on depth. Therefore, if I put an object in a fluid, the pressures acting on that object are going to be different. That means there will be different forces that are exerted on that object. That means that fluids exert a net force on any object placed within them. This net force is called the buoyant force, and we will see that in our next lecture. For now, thank you for paying attention. Best of luck to you in the studio as you continue to explore these ideas.